Let me begin by giving a few sound signposts about where I'm going to try to go in this uh, lecture. First of all, I'm going to be discussing uh, the main thesis of Ronald Dworkin's recent book, Justice for Hedgehogs. Ronald Dworkin is a very distinguished American philosopher, very wide-ranging in his interests, legal philosophy, moral philosophy, and uh, political philosophy. Uh, I then try to suggest that his view, uh, though he is a non-believer, uh, lends itself very happily to a theistic uh, or religious uh, interpretation. Uh, and then I will pose the question, well, if you can have a really valid secular ethics, what's there different about a Christian uh, ethics? What, what, what really is the difference? Now, you've probably heard that famous statement, if God did not exist, everything would be permitted. It's the voice of Ivan Karamazov in Dostoevsky's uh, great book. Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, the instigator of post-war existentialism, took that as his starting point. And in particular, he said, if there is no God, there is no objective moral order at all. It's simply down uh, to... Uh, us. And I suppose it would be true to say that Professor Cottingham, I, uh, uh, Professor Ward, and, and indeed Stephen, we've all been brought up and shaped by the prevailing uh, consensus uh, in philosophy that ethics is a human construct with the implication that everything is subjective and re relative. Now, what is very interesting about Ronald Dawkins' uh, new book is that, so far as I know, he's a pretty convinced non uh, believer. Uh, is that he thinks that we can argue, genuinely argue, for the truth of our ethical and moral judgments. He's totally uh, against what you might call a fundamental scepticism, a, a radical subjectivity. And in that, he's very, very different, certainly, from uh, most of the kind of philosophers that some of us uh, grew, grew up with. Also fundamental to his position is that ethical values cannot be derived from either science or metaphysics. And therefore, this is an important implication, they can't be undermined by anything that science says uh, or indeed supported by anything uh, that religion says. Uh, the question as to whether there is a metaphysical reality to which the name God applies has, according to him, absolutely no bearing on one's ethical ideal and set of, uh, of moral, moral, moral values. It says nothing at all uh, about whether ethics can be true or false. Belief in a God does not substantiate the ethical uh, realm, and disbelief does not undermine it. The realm of value for him exists in its own right. Now, the justification for this conviction, according to Dworkin, is that when we're asked questions about what is right or wrong, the answer will always take the form of moral reasoning. And any attempt to go outside moral reasoning by appeals to scientific findings or religious beliefs totally fails to address the question. And this suggests that all argument about ethics and morality is in the end circular. And he accepts this conclusion. It is circular because whatever we say outside that circle about science or metaphysics is a different realm of discourse. And that is why he also rejects all attempts to produce a kind of meta-ethic ethics because that very concept assumes that there is a position beyond ethics itself which can, which can justify the ethical endeavour. And it is just this which he rejects. To think and live ethically is to be engaged in moral reasoning. And it is just that, moral reasoning, and it, not something else. And as Dworkin puts it, we're always guilty of a kind of circularity. There is no way I can test the accuracy of my moral convictions except by deploying further moral convictions. My reasons for thinking that tax cheating is wrong are good reasons if the arguments I rely on are good ones. If I'm faced with someone who holds moral opinions radically different from my own, I cannot 
count on finding anything in my set or reasons or arguments that would be irrational not to accept. I cannot demonstrate to him that my opinions are true and his false, but I can hope to convince him. Uh, and he would hope to convince that person by producing yet another uh, argument until, you might say, till the penny drops. Now, Dworkin uses the phrase value holism, which is the phrase I refer to in the title of uh, this lecture. He uses that phrase about his position because fundamental to it is that one's personal ethical ideal, uh, which he calls ethics, and how one treats others, which expresses it, and which he calls morality, need to be consistent with the judgments we make in philosophy, law, and all other areas of human endeavor. Concepts like dignity, equality, liberty, and democracy hang together in a consistent whole and reinforce and support one another. Now again, this is a very, very unfashionable view, going as it does against the position that you so often hear that values are incommensurable. You simply cannot weigh one, one up against another. Uh, and that there is no justifying whole in which they can all have a proper place. So Dworkin writes of his value holism that it is the hedgehog's faith, which is the faith, as he says, that all true values form an interlocking network, that each of our convictions about what is good or right or beautiful plays some rolling role in supporting each of our other convictions in each of those domains of value. We can seek truth in morality only by pursuing coherence endorsed by conviction. We can seek truth in morality only by pursuing coherence endorsed by conviction. And he calls his book Justice for Hedgehogs, and I'm sure you've been puzzled by that title as I was when I first saw it. After the ancient Greek distinction made famous in modern times by Isaiah Berlin, that the fox knows many things, and the hedgehog one big thing. And the big thing for Dworkin is the value holism that I have uh, described. That is, that all your fundamental ethical beliefs, whether it's about the political system, uh, or whether it's about how you should behave to other people, any sphere, it all has to hold, hold together in a, in a kind of circle. Um, everything fits in with everything else, everything supports uh, everything else. Um, and for those of you who have neat and tidy minds, it's actually a rather attractive idea that you can actually put everything together in this wonderful holistic way. Now what is one to make of this from the standpoint of Christian theology? Uh, I believe we should welcome it. Uh, obviously his position raises the old question of Euthyphro's uh, dilemma, uh, which I know uh, Professor Cottingham touched on uh, this morning. Uh, just to remind you, as originally posed, it was formulated as, is what is pious loved by God because it is pious, or is it pious because it is loved by God? But in its later Christian formulation, it can be put uh, in the form, is what is good, good because God wills it, or does God will it because it is good? Now, if we're going to align Dworkin on one side of that uh, debate, then clearly he would come down on the, uh, on the, on the, the side uh, which says that something uh, is good anyway and things are not just good because God wills them to be good. Uh, there is this independent realm uh, of, uh, of, of value. Now, and I just picked up the last bit of the discussion of the, this morning from, I think there was a question uh, from that quarter of the room about, uh, about the sort of Bible uh, view of, of ethics. It's usually assumed uh, that uh, the Bible offers a divine command theory of value. That is, things are good because God wills them uh, to be good. But this has actually, I think, recently shown to be not the whole truth in uh, uh, an essay in a very, very valuable book, which I also recommend to you, called God, Goodness and Philosophy, uh, edited by Harriet Harris, it's just been published, in which Professor Cottingham also has an interesting essay. Now the person who has done this chapter on divine command theory 
uh, says that if you look at the Psalms, for example, sentences like, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Shall not the judge of the earth do justly? And has God forgotten to be gracious? Just to take three phrases almost at random from the Psalms, it assumes that there is a realm of value which we, as it were, apply to God and almost, if you like, judge God by. So it's not entirely true that the Bible offers simply uh, a, a divine command theory uh, of value. There's something, there's, there's a strand in the Bible which suggests, as what Ronald Dawkins is arguing, that there is a realm of value which, as it were, exists uh, separately or independently uh, for God. Now, if you take that Ronald Dawkin view, if you take that view, the trouble seems to be for religious believers that it sets up a standard of judgment uh, in the light of which even God is judged. And traditionally, God is meant to be the source and the standard of everything. How, how come that we can possibly have an independent source of judgment in the light of which we judge God uh, himself? Um, now, I think uh, that we have to face uh, this uh, particular uh, dilemma, but what I'd like to uh, su suggest, uh, it, first of all, uh, is that it does not undermine what it means for God to be God, because from a religious point of view, uh, a fundamental aspect of us being human is that all of us, simply by virtue of human, have some capacity for moral discernment. You know much better than I do. You don't have to be religious to have some kind of capacity for moral discernment. That belongs to us as human beings. Now, traditionally, this was expressed in the doctrine known as of, of natural law. Uh, the old doctrine of natural law, which thought that you could simply look at nature and read off God's law, no longer holds. But I think the truth in it is what I've just suggested, that simply by virtue of the fact that we're human, we have some capacity for moral awareness and for what moral uh, discernment. Um, and therefore, the idea that there is this realm of value which we can, can sort of grasp in some way as human, human beings uh, does not undermine a religious person's view of God. On the whole, it seems to me, it is something which one endorses and celebrates because uh, the one who gives us such this godlike capacity uh, is indeed a God of such humility that he gives us this ability to make moral judgments, even about the reality, which we may come to see as the so ultimately as the source and standard of, of all that you recognize uh, as good. Now, Dworkin believes that the Galilean revolution set science free of metaphysics to pursue truth by its own methods. Uh, and now moral reasoning uh, needs to be set free from the assumptions of science in order to produce, pr 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 pursue truth in its own appropriate way. And he believes that what has bedeviled philosophy and ethics in recent decades has been the assumption that they have to work with the same assumptions as scientists. He rejects this and says that the appropriate method uh, for ethics is a form of interpretation. Now, in several very complex chapters, which I can't go into, he considers all the different kinds of interpretation which we engage in as human beings in different subjects. Uh, and he argues for uh, what he calls uh, conceptual uh, interpretation, um, uh, whereby uh, we, 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 we interpret everything, and there is no, but there is no fixed point above which we can stand and, and say, yes, that is true and, and that is that. Everything is, everything is interpreted. Everything in life is in, interpreted. Um, as he put it, interpretation goes all the, way, uh, all the way down. But what matters for him is that our different forms of interpretation rooted in our moral practices, as I say, all cohere together and support uh, one another. Now, I don't believe that the moral arguments for the existence of God are logically persuasive any more than Dworkin does. Nevertheless, I do think that there is something about Ronald Dworkin's position that is open to, perhaps even cries out for, a theological interpretation. 
I focus first of all on his view that in answer to the question of why it might be right to pursue some particular course of action, all one can do is give moral reasons. If you remember I said, all he said is you, you've just to go on giving moral reasons. Um, if those reasons are questions, you have to give further ones. There is no way out of this circle of moral reasoning, any more than in science there is any way out of the circle of scientific reasoning. However, of course the question in your mind, a question in my mind, you know, when does this reasoning stop? When one develops, in his words, a conviction, when one develops a conviction, uh, I quoted the phrase earlier on, we talked about coherence supported by conviction. Discussing an example of philosophers arguing over whether utilitarianism can or cannot provide an all-encompassing principle to guide moral decision-making, Dawkins says, we can never simply stop and say, well, the principle just happens to be, as a matter of fact, to be true. We should always be prepared to go on giving other moral reasons for our convictions, even at the most general level of theory. As he puts it, Philosophers' habit of claiming intuitions might mislead us. In its innocent use, the claim is only a statement of conviction. It might also suggest an inability to provide a further reason for that conviction. But it should not be meant to, uh, meant, uh, or to, uh, to be understood to deny the possibility of further reason. Now, I quite agree that we must go on reasoning as, as so long as, as we want to go on reasoning, going on giving more and more reasons. But it seems to me without the emergence of a conviction at some point in the arguing, there can be no moral argument at all, indeed no moral realm. Whether this is a fundamental conviction that enhancing the pleasure of others is a good and causing them pain and evil, or whether it has to do with acting in a morally consistent uh, way and treating other people as ends in themselves, as uh, not means to an end, or whatever the conviction is, you've got to have a conviction of some sort to get this moral reasoning going in the first place. And at the end, that moral conviction will either remain or it will be changed in some way as a result of the moral reasoning, or it might even be altered to a new moral conviction. Uh, but it seems to me that at some, po at some point, and underlying it all, there will be this element of conviction. And it seems to me that it is this human capacity to have and to develop moral convictions which calls out for a wider interpretive framework than Dworkin himself allows. And these convictions are not simply the convictions that emerge uh, from what is already implicit in the premises, as in maths. There was another question this morning I picked up by somebody who asked wh wh whether there was any, any resemblance to tautological states. And the short answer uh, is that that's not really part of, uh, of this process. Uh, it's only one element if it's there at all. Uh, it is the conviction that emerges when a moral premise is recognised as such. Uh, that is a moral premise which persuades us. And this is a matter of recognition or insight. It does not, as Dworkin insists, preclude further moral reasoning, but it must be there or there'd be no moral reasoning uh, in, the, in the first place. Now, the convictions for Dworkin, quite simple, uh, they, as emerges in this book on his, and his previous one, is first of all 